Hi folks, in this video I'm going to be walking you guys through the visual soil health assessment for the soil diagnosis process. So to complete this exercise all you need is a print off of that soil health visual assessment PDF and a shovel. Now it can also be handy, handy to have a small piece of cardboard and there's five optional tests at the bottom from 11 to 15 at the bottom of the visual soil health assessment PDF that we'll be covering at the end of this video and checking out some of the tools that you would need to complete some of those exercises. Now before we begin the visual soil health assessment, it's important to remember the four needs of soil. Uh, the air, water, food, and shelter. So just like humans, the soil has those, those same four basic needs. And, and all these indicators we're gonna be looking at and the tests that we're gonna be going through are to try to figure out which one of those four needs, basic needs in the soil is, is your limiting factor so that you can uh, focus on which soil health principles are gonna help address that. So the very first indicator is ground cover. Now, the, the, this is gonna vary you know, where you're doing it on your, on your property, um, whether it's a garden or a pasture or annual cropland. But the general principles is, from the soil health principles, is you want to have the ground covered 24-7. Uh, uh, the UV sunlight actually sterilizes the soil, it heats up the soil, uh, which can, um, can kill organisms. Keeping the soil covered also provides uh, one of the four basic needs, which is, which is shelter. Uh, it also provides food for, this, for soil organisms, and it also helps to slow ev evaporation. So it basically takes care of, of three of those four basic needs. So once you've, you've figured out where you want to test, you want to look for you know, about a, uh, a, a square foot of soil that, you, that you're going to be testing. So I'm looking at you know, one of the, the pathways in our garden here right now, and we've got 100% soil coverage because we've actually been growing cover crops in our, in our uh, pathways here and then using a scythe to, to cut that cover crop down to provide mulch to keep our soil covered. So, you know, we've got a, uh, a gold score for the, um, the first metric there of ground cover because we're easily over 75%. Now, the next stage is we want to look for the diversity of macro life uh, in about a square foot of soil. So taking that same piece then, we want to start to peel back any of that ground cover and you got to be really quick as you're, you're looking for uh, the different kinds of species of organisms. So right now, I can see I've got one species, two, I've got a third one there, I've got, uh, there's four, there's a slug, I've got some, so there's like, there's spiders, there's mites, oh, there's five, there's a little orm, oh, there's a nematode, six, there's some kind of a beetle that's different. seven and again we're, we're looking for uh, individual species there's there's literally thousands of, of organisms that are on the top of the soil surface but I'm looking for for species that that look different because you're looking for the diversity of macro life not the individual species so we're, we're easily at, oh no there's eight um, uh, a bunch of eggs there I count that as nine so we're we're easily at nine or ten uh, in, in just a, a square foot of soil here which uh, puts us again at, at gold you know we're, we're um, that's exactly where we want to be now the the next test is to look at you know the leaf color of the plants around you and um, this is a kind of a, a tricky test because I've, I've just cut this soil cover crop the other day but I'm gonna I'm gonna look around uh, outside of the the square foot there that we're testing to look at you know some of our onions here some of our peas and you know our potatoes on this side and I don't see any uh, strange colorations uh, there are a few holes in the the leaves of, of, of this potato here but they're they're very small and, and uh, not of concern and you know all of the plants I'm looking at don't show any signs of of any discoloration or um, uh, you know uh, browns, yellows, uh, reds that might indicate some minerals that are lacking in the soil. 
So everything and, and the growth the growth of the these plants is all all uniform and even. So we've got gold for that as well. Now the the next test is to look at the depth of the O horizon. We just peeled off the, the O horizon, so you, you need to go to a, another spot that hasn't had that, that uh, most layer peeled off and, and basically start digging up um, uh, a portion of the soil. And for this, I like to get about, you know, a, a six to eight inch piece that's roughly square and, and pull that guy out. So once you've made kind of a box that's about you know eight to twelve inches wide all the way around, you can try to pry that out of the soil, trying to maintain it in one solid piece. And this is where your piece of cardboard comes in handy so that you don't lose any of the the organisms or or anything that we're we're dealing with there. So right away, uh, what you can see is, and if I look at that, that soil profile is we've got a really good O layer, which is the, um, the layer of the soil that, that isn't quite broken down. So it's, it hasn't quite turned into soil yet, um, but it's, it's not alive anymore. So this stuff was just cut the other day. That's why it's still green, but it's, it's no longer living. And you can see we're easily, you know, uh, an inch to half an inch if you were to pack it down. So again, we've got um, you know, gold, gold conditions there. And uh, the, the test here is, is in centimeters. So uh, 2.5 centimeters is, is an inch. So we're, we're well over that. So we've got gold again for that. Now the, the other, the next test number five is we're looking at the, the decomposition rate of that O horizon. So, you know, if, if I peel that back, can I see uh, various stages of decomposition on the different layers of the, the soil. And I absolutely can. Uh, I'm seeing, you know, the, the I've, this is the third time that I've cut this cover crop. And so I'm seeing, uh, you know, really good. The soil's really nice and moist. I'm seeing, uh, you know, earthworm castings on the surface of the soil. Uh, there's even you know, slime from, from different organisms that have been moving around and you can see plants are literally getting sucked into the soil. So that's a, a really, really good sign that decomposition is happening and that O horizon is being mixed in to the, um, the soil layers lower lower down. So again, we've got an O horizon. And the, the other test there is if, you, if you're in like a cropland or a pasture and you can see looking back at the different years of, of different kinds of crops. If you can, you know, dig out a piece of soil and see what you planted, you know, three, four years ago, that means you've got a very slow nutrient cycle, um, which is the process through which life lives again. So where you've got minerals that come from below the sur sur soil surface to above the soil surface, to upon the soil surface, to back below the soil surface. And if it's taking more than, more than a year and, and, if you've got good moisture conditions, this can even happen in you know weeks to, to months. Um, but the longer that process takes to, to cycle, the the less effective your nutrient cycle is going to be, and that means your soil is not going to have as much food. Um, it's also which means you're not going to have as much carbon in your soil, which is going to affect the water that you need, and it's there's a good chance it's also going to be affecting the oxygen in your soil. Um, as well, because it's it's uh, the carbon is going to help create the structure that allows oxygen to to get into those those pores in the soil. So the the next process here, and and at this stage we're actually kind of doing uh, step five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine, and ten together. Because as we're breaking this clod up, we want to look at the soil structure. We want to look. We'll also be looking for mycelium development, which is the, those little white thread-like structures in the soil that are the, the roots of, of mushrooms. Uh, we're also looking at root development, figuring out how deep these roots are going into the ground, uh, whether or not they, they look abnormal. Uh, we're also going to be looking for the soil coating on uh, roots which, which 
is an indicator of uh, healthy bacterial relationships and organism relationships between plants because the plants actually exude uh, sugars. Uh, actually, the, the majority of the sugars that, that plants photosynthesize um, via their green leaves, they don't actually use themselves for growth. They actually pump that into the soil to attract in organisms so that they can, can trade the sugars for, for minerals with those other organisms. And by doing that, those, the bacteria and, and different organisms basically create colonies around the, the surface of the roots, which, which uh, gives the roots this kind of fat, dreadlocky uh, type appearance. Um, and we're also going to be counting for earthworms as we're going through this stage. So we're, we're kind of doing a lot of things um, all at once here. <clears throat> so I'm going to start breaking this up. And right away, I found two earthworms. So I'm going to set those guys, oh, three. So I'm going to set these guys aside for my earthworm count. So there's one, two, three, four... Come on, guys. Don't be shy. So, two, three, four. And the reason why it's such a good idea, oh, they're trying to get away. That's four. So the reason why earthworms are such a great indicator is that they're, they're one of the climax organisms or the keystone species in the soil. And if, if they're present in really good numbers, you know that you've got all of the other uh, levels in the, the soil food web that are active um, because if, if, if there wasn't you know, nematodes and bacteria and protozoa and, and all the other mi microorganisms that you would normally need some kind of a microscope or a device to, to see, uh, um, you know, if you just see that there's a bunch of earthworms, you can assume that everything else is present and you've got really good soil health conditions. So these guys are actually crawling back into the soil. So one, two, uh, three, four, geez, they're quick, four, five, six, um, and that's, that we're already at gold, and I haven't even finished, uh, breaking everything up, there's seven, uh, okay, so we are, we're well past, there's eight, <clears throat> so in, out oh, nine in in that tiny little space of uh, you know less than a, a cubic foot of soil, we've got uh, you know easily ten earthworms. If uh, if I break this guy apart, we'll probably get our tenth one in one of these clods here. <clears throat> there we go. There's there's ten. Okay, so you've got ten earthworms in that that tiny little soil. So. I mean, the gold is about uh, six per shovel, but if, if you, if you want to scale this up, there's, there's 43,560 uh, square feet in one acre. And so if, if you, uh, you know, this was about, uh, we'll call it eight, eight inches or, or um, we'll call it six inches just for ease of, of calculations. But if, if six inches of soil has 10 earthworms in it, then uh, if you were to, to double that, uh, you're looking at almost a million earthworms per acre in, in 43,560 square feet of, of soil. And there we go, there's 11. So uh, that is a fantastic number of earthworms. And uh, that means that these guys are, they're going to be sucking carbon from above the soil surface down into the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the lower levels of the soil and... Um, creating channels for oxygen to, to get through deep down in the soil, pathways for roots, a whole bunch of, of really good things. So uh, we're going to go ahead and, and mark the earthworms as a gold. And now when we talk about soil structure, what we're looking for is like a nice chocolatey cake soil. It's, so it's very friable. When I, when I push on it lightly, it gives, gives way and it has... As you break it up into these structures, it's it has very nice a nice crumb like um, chocolate cake structure. And the larger the the crumbs of soil, the the healthier your soil is because these these little crumbs are actually being formed by different organisms in, in the soil that are they're essentially secreting different 
uh, you know, glomulins and, and sugars and, and enzymes that are binding the soil structure together in these little crumbs. They're like little cities of organisms. So that, and the reason they're doing that is when, so that it's a, um, an adaptive strategy to, to help deal with rain and not being washed through the soil. So they actually bind themselves together in these little cities so that as, as water's coming down, they don't get washed through and, and they're, they're probably able to, you know, share nutrients more efficiently that way. But that, that all that structure of the soil helps to create uh, pathways for, for water, for air, and for roots to, to come through. So we are easily at a gold for our soil structure because we've got really friable soils and clods that are bigger than a millimeter in, uh, in length. And I'm not seeing any, uh, there's very few angular shapes in this soil, which you want really nice round shapes. If you've got blocky brick-like soil, you're obviously not going to be getting water and oxygen into that into that soil surface. Now, one of the other things we're going to look at here is, you know, our, our root development. And so, you know, this plant right here has roots that are going, you know, several inches into the soil. And actually, if I if I look into the the side of this this channel here, you know, I can see roots going down, you know, several um, at least to the bottom of the bottom of the trench here. But I'm, I'm seeing, you know, really nice hair-like roots. And uh, oh, there's another earthworm that puts us at 12. And I'm also seeing lots of uh, really healthy um, uh, root coatings on the, on our plant roots. So that is, uh, if you look at some of these, these roots here, you can see they've, they've, they've got these thick coatings on those roots. It's actually easier to see on, on smaller plants that aren't, aren't as old, but uh, we've definitely got, got some of those signs here. And I'm actually gonna use a little soil trial, trial here to actually try to dig up uh, an individual plant to, to have a better look at it. I kind of bunged that other one up as I was, as I was going through it. So yeah, we've got really nice, like the soil is actually getting locked together by all this this rooting structure and yeah we're seeing really really good root development different sizes of roots uh, like different forms in terms of we got you know top rooted plants we also have um, uh, cover crops um, uh, or um, cover crops we've got nitrogen fixing uh, clovers in this in this system as well and so one of the things you can look for if you have clover species is if you look at the rooting structure of, of clovers, what, you're, what you want to see is you want to see little nodules on the roots of these clovers because if you can see those nodules present, like I'm seeing right now, I'll pull this guy up, you can see how the, the, um, the, the dirt is just clinging to those, those rootlets. But if we look at uh, some of these roots here, you can see the little balls on the, this, this cl clover root. And those uh, little balls are little colonies of rhizobium bacteria, which are taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and uh, pulling it into the soil, making it available to, to plants. And some of these crops, like uh, crimson clover, uh, has the ability to fix 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, per year into the soil from the atmosphere for free. It, it, the, so the value of that is, is more than $75 an, uh, an acre if you're at at 150 pounds because nitrogen fertilizer is a roughly equi equivalent to 50 cents um, uh, a pound of fertilizer. So that completes the, um, the decomposition. We had gold there. We had, um, you know, mycelium development. I, I didn't see any mycelium development as I was coming through here, but you know, the, um, I'm, not, I'm not super concerned about that because this is an annual garden. And um, uh, I know there are mushrooms here because I've, I've, I've seen um, you know, mushrooms grow in our gardens. But uh, sometimes if you get you know, later successional uh, soils where uh, you know, it's more of like a pasture or a, an orchard type system, you can actually see those, those little threads. There's another earthworm, that's 12. Uh, so even though I, I haven't seen any of those, those thread-like uh, myceliums, the, um, I'm, I'm not... I'm not too concerned about that. So uh, if we look at, um, 
you know, that's a, that's a bronze. But given that this is, like I said, an early successional soil, it's, it's not a big deal. So the root coatings, uh, root development, there's many fine roots throughout. That's a gold. And we've got a really good uh, uh, um, coating on, on all those fine rootlets. So there's another one. That's, that's 13 earthworms in, uh, in that little clump of soil. So based on those first 10 metrics um, and, and considering what the weak link is in our soil, uh, the oxygen, the water, the, the food, or the shelter, you know, I'm not really concerned about, about any of these right now. And um, uh, because, you know, we've, we've, we've got really good structure, which means we're getting air. We've got uh, lots of organic matter on the soil surface, literally hundreds of pounds per acre of, of organic matter because we're, we're integrating cover crops into this garden. Uh, there's, there's no evidence of compaction. We've got, um, you know, all the signs of, of, of healthy earthworm and, and uh, like, you know, double the, the diversity of, 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 of uh, you know, a, 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 like a really healthy level of, of organisms. All in all, I'm really, really happy with the, the quality of soil in this, in this garden here. And there's actually not much that I would, I would do to change. Now, this, if we were to uh, have done this soil test, you know, 10 years ago, when we first came back to this yard site, we would have basically been digging into uh, clay uh, and we would have failed or, or got bronze on every single one of these metrics. Um, and uh, uh, once we finished in this spot, we're going to go around and look at a, f at a few other spots on the farm to, to show, you know, what soils look like that aren't, aren't quite as, as healthy and, and, and to go through some of the diagnosis processes for how you would figure out which of the soil health principles you can focus on to try to address that, that weak link. But before we do that, I want to cover those, those final five tests at the bottom. The uh, infiltration of water, uh, soil compaction tests, uh, soil temperature, uh, the a plant tish tissue bricks test, and uh, a soil pH. Now the next test we're going to be doing is the water infiltration test. And to do this, you need uh, some kind of a pipe or a planter pot works really well with the bottom cut off that's exactly six inches in diameter and then you need uh, a measuring device that equals 500 milliliters and the reason for that is that uh, 500 milliliters divided up over six inches is the equivalent to a one inch rainfall so we'll be taking 500 milliliters of soil or 500 millimeters of water and our uh, area to simulate a six inch rainfall. And we're gonna go and we're going to put this, um, this planter into the ground. And you wanna make sure that it's, it's into the ground below your O horizon layer. Uh, the reason for that is if, it's, if you just set it on the top of the soil surface, that O horizon will wick it sideways and it won't give you an accurate reading when you actually pour in the, um, the water. So we've got our planter pot in the ground here. We've got our water and we're gonna pour it in and start counting. So. And we wanna watch around the outside of the, the pipe to make sure that water isn't seeping up from somewhere else. And it's not. So that means that the water is having to infiltrate directly into the soil. So we've just uh, simulated a one inch rainfall uh, all at once and uh, we just passed the uh, 30 second mark now and uh, you know this is this test isn't going to be as as good as I would like uh, mainly because we've just had so much rain this year as you can see by you know the the, the quality of the soil here it's it's we're at almost capacity so um, the this is is probably going to take longer than I would um, that I would normally like. So you have to take that into consideration when you're, you're doing your soil tests is whether the ground is, is totally dry or, um, or you've, you, it's at you know, capacity for water. But still, we're actually getting some pretty decent, we're about halfway through and we just passed the, the one minute mark. And it's, you can also see, if you look into the water there, you can see some of the nematodes uh, in the soil that are swimming around. And not all nematodes are bad. Some of them actually are, are really helpful 
in uh, in cycling soil nutrients and um, and eating some of the actually some of the predatory organisms. So we just passed two and a half minutes, and we're almost infiltrated. And the other reason why you know this test isn't going to be as good is because we're actually in a, in a pathway here. So there is is going to be a bit of compaction in that we're we're walking down you know the the rows in our in our garden here and 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 somewhat sealing off the soil surface but despite our our soils being at you know full capacity and this being a pathway we have um it's almost finished you, you want to you want to stop the timer when it's when it's, the soil is just glistening so there you go it's i would put that at, at three minutes was um was for this was how long it took to infiltrate one inch of water and which still puts us in in the, the the silver realm which is is quite good and and being the fact that our our soil is is so wet right now um i would actually classify this as as a gold so i'm not i'm not concerned about um uh, this infiltration test at all now the other really interesting thing you can do once you've finished your uh infiltration test with uh with your six inch pot and 500 milliliters of water is you can pull this guy out and you can grab your shovel and you can cut that uh, zone of soil that you infiltrated the water in out of the ground and you can look for patterns of, of water infiltration to see uh, how the water was moving through the soil you know did you did you luck out and get um, an earthworm channel and that's why it was so good or uh, was there was, was the the soil carbon pulling it sideways at a you know, 45 degree angle or steeper or was it just infiltrating straight down into the soil so we're gonna pull this this soil profile out of the ground and and then we're going to cut it in half and we're gonna take a peek at what that uh, infiltration was like so I'm gonna take my shovel here and cut that in half and so if we look at the, the side profile that it's really interesting I actually can't really see like there's some some muddy spots but I can't really see um, the well there's a few channels that the water had leaked down but all in all it's it's pretty well infiltrated throughout the whole soil surface here like there's there's not um, a bunch of mud in, in one particular pocket and so and when you're looking for those those patterns obviously this is this is one of the edge um, edges where the water was you know was sealed off so it was rubbing up against there but that's a really good sign is that that the, um, the amount of carbon in the soil is acting like you know a bounty quicker picker upper and that it's sucking it sideways through capillary action and uh and spreading it out through the soil it's not just gravity pulling it straight down so that's a, a really good sign for uh, a positive indicator that the uh, water is being really well taken care of and that there's enough carbon in the soil which means there's food and shelter so another test we're going to be doing is looking at the, your soil compaction and to do this at a minimum you need a, a piece of wire uh, a wire coat hanger works really good for this so just cut it in in one spot and and unwind it and find a spot I've been kneeling and walking all over this spot so I'm going to come back a little bit here but you know I've got a uh, almost a, a three foot length of wire here and I'm going to push this into the soil and I'm just going to feel for you know, any layers that are, are harder than others or where I might have any issues and uh, basically if the wire starts to bend before you can you can push it all the way in you've got some kind of a compaction issue. But, you know, I'm down all the way there, uh, almost three feet with uh, absolutely no compaction whatsoever. If you want to, uh, you know, kind of upgrade, we've got, you can buy soil penetrometers that actually have a, uh, an analog readout of the, the pressure that's being placed on the, the tip. And so I can do that same test and ideally, on this particular model with this size of tip, we don't want to be going above uh, 200 psi, and we are, you know, just barely uh, over 100, going down all the way. So, you know, I'm not seeing 
any compaction whatsoever, which means we don't have uh, an air problem, and it means we don't have a water infiltration problem. All right, so the next test we're gonna look at is soil temperature. So there's, you can use any kind of thermometer you want. This is a little uh, digital voltmeter that I, uh, I have for some of the other testing that we do on the farm. So you can see right now that ambient temperature is about uh, 28 degrees uh, Celsius. And I'm gonna go ahead and put this probe underneath my soil, soil mulch. So underneath the, um, so the, the ambient temperature was 28 degrees Celsius and underneath my mulch is, is less than, uh, um, and underneath my mulch is just over 20 degrees Celsius, which is, which is perfect. That's, that's a, that gives us a, a gold as well. And the, the reason why temperatures is a great indicator of, of soil health is because uh, if, if your soil temperatures are, are, you know, between 20 and 35 degrees Celsius, you're going to be losing up to 85% of your uh, water through evaporation. And if it's any higher than that, you can lose 100% of your water. And if it's higher than 60 degrees Celsius, which is if you ever walked across your garden in bare feet and, and it hurt and you couldn't stand on it, that means that everything in your soil is literally being sterilized uh, uh, because the, the soil is, is, is so hot. But also you have to think about those, those UV lights. You know, UV filtration is used to kill organisms. And if you've got uh, the sun bearing down at your, um, at your bare soil, you're obviously going to be killing those organisms, which is going to affect the, the food. It's also going to affect your water, meaning you're going to be evaporating stuff. And uh, uh, so this is um, a, another really simple test that you can do to, to see. And, and we're, we're midday right now, and that's a, that's a great time to test your soil temperature. Okay, the next test we're gonna be looking at is to do a BRICS reading or a refractometer reading on some of the plants in our garden here to see how well they're, they're photosynthesizing. So a, a BRICS test or a refractometer test is basically just measuring the bending of light through a liquid. And the, the d level of sugars that are in the liquid that's on this particular uh, prism space here, um, the amount of dissolved solids is going to affect how light bends through that liquid. So if it's just water, it won't bend at all, it'll come straight through. But if it's the more sugars, it's going to bend more, and it's going to give us an indicator reading as we look through this uh, particular refractometer to show us uh, a, a percent of dissolved solids or dissolved sugars in our, in our plant. So if you are going to get one of these refractometers, make sure you get one that says ATC on it, which means automatic temperature compensation, because the, the, uh, some of the, the cheaper quality refractometers don't have that capability. And depending on what temperature is outside, it can actually affect how uh, light is bending through the prisms. And this is not an exact science, and, and you want to make sure that you're controlling as many variables as possible. Um, so the, the other thing you'll need is a, is a pretty good quality garlic press. Um, uh, ideally get one that's, that's solid stainless steel and is, is really, really well made. I've broken about 10 of these before I found uh, a good model that, that worked. So I'm going to be testing some onion leaves here. And the way that you want to do that is you want to um, crumple them up and just kind of roll them in the palms of your hands to break down some of the cell walls. And uh, it'll just help get some more juices out of there. And uh, stick it in your, your garlic press get your uh, refractometer ready and press out a few drops of the liquid across the plate and then you just close that little lid down and as you look through it you can get a measurement of the dissolved solids. Now this particular reading is, is quite low. It's actually below five, which is, is not a very good reading based on uh, some of the baseline testing uh, that's available online. Um, and what I've noticed in, uh, in doing, using BRICS testing is that there's a lot of variability in, uh, in the amount of dissolved solids. So uh, for example, the, the stage of the moon, the, the temperature outside, the, the time of day, those all are going to affect the amount of water that's in the plant, uh, how soon rain has, has happened in the past. Because typically the, in drier conditions, you actually get higher BRICS readings than if you've had more rain. So 
the, um, again, these are, these are just, uh, all these tests are just one data point. And so if, if, you, if you do this test and you see like, like we've got here that you know, our, our BRICS levels are, are only at a, at a five, uh, when you know the the good tests say that they should be at a ten, um, you, you have to look at that in in context of, of everything else and the fact that we've had you know twelve inches of rain already this year, which is way more than our average, is not something that I'm particularly concerned about. Uh, one of the other uh, really important baselines to do um, to kind of calibrate this is if you are going to use some of these, is to test your weeds as well as testing the plants you're trying to grow. And one of the soil health teachers that I, I studied under had this, this great analogy in that um, the, this refract number test is basically measuring your plant's ability to photosynthesize because they're, they're taking uh, photons with, and converting it with chlorophyll into sugar and then you're measuring that. So the more sugars, the healthier your plants are. Now, again, because of all those other, other variables you can't control, the, the stage of the sun, the temperature outside, the time of day you tested, how soon you've had uh, rain afterwards, what you can do is calibrate it in real time with other plants right next to it. So uh, basically test the weeds and if the weeds are, are photosynthesizing more efficiently than the crops you're trying to produce then you've got problems because you've actually created the conditions for the things you don't want to grow to thrive more than the things that you that you do want to grow. So just to, to show that I'm gonna grab uh, some dandelions uh, from some of the cover crop here, and we're going to measure that and see how, how, how well that's doing. So I couldn't find any dandelions, but I managed to find some mallow. So we're going to be testing that instead. Now, I'm just going to, I've already broken those cell walls, and I'm just squeezing a few juices on here, and we're going to take a peek and see. So, <laughs> So we're actually sitting at about a three, which is less than what our onions were, uh, which is a really good sign. So if, if I went and tested, you know, the potatoes and my peas and my carrots and my beets, which I was actually doing last night, and I found that they're all above five, I'm not concerned about it because I know that, that the, the plants that I'm trying to grow are doing better than the plants that I'm not trying to grow. The next test we're going to be looking at is soil pH. So to do this, you're going to need some kind of a soil pH test kit. Uh, this is, these are some that I used to uh, sell myself. They were they developed out of uh, Australia um, from in inocula.com, uh, but you can also get you know digital pH meters and um, uh, and you know other litmus test uh, things as well. So you want to start out by grabbing a bit of soil, putting it in your um, in your test plate there, and you want to you know cover it with the. Uh, um, the, in this particular case, there's, there's a, a two-part dye system, and you want to uh, stir that up and make sure the dye is, is really well um, mixed throughout the whole soil surface. And you want to be careful not to touch this with your, with your hands so that uh, you know, any acids that are on your, your fingers aren't going to, to get in the way. So you want to mix around with this particular test, mix up that, um, that, in, that indicator dye until it's a nice paste. And uh, once you're good there, you can take the second part of the dye and sprinkle it across the surface. And then you wait a few uh, seconds and then there'll be some kind of a, a color indicator that will uh, uh, indicate what the, the soil pH is for this particular test. So it's been about a minute now and all of the uh, the second stage indicator dye has uh, has changed color and I would say we're sitting somewhere between a seven and a half and an eight which means we're a little bit uh, more alkaline than neutral which is is not a big problem for for us. Uh, I actually anticipated that our soils were going to be alkaline uh, because we live right next to an alkali lake, so that's actually perfectly normal and um, uh, nothing to worry about there. So that finishes up the 15 different metrics that you can look at to help identify which of those four ingredients are lacking in your soil. The, the water, the uh, oxygen, the food, or the shelter. 
And as you can tell here, you know, we, we don't really have any issues in this particular garden, but we're going to go out and check some of our other pastures as well as uh, some healthy Climax successional ecosystems on our farm, a forest that has, hasn't been touched for 100 plus years, and we're going to see how well that soil is compared to this. So we're out in one of our pastures here on the farm in between two of our forest gardens. We've got a six-year-old forest garden above us and uh, one of our newly planted forest gardens below us here. And uh, we're, I just wanted to show you guys some of the, the difference in pasture production uh, just in a very short distance uh, away from each other. So you can see in this pasture here, like, like uh, you can't actually see, you know, my, my feet as I'm, as I'm walking through this. And it's actually, I can't shuffle my feet as I'm walking through this this particular pasture, it's, it's pretty difficult. So this is this is a pretty good um, uh, growth of, of pasture. But if we come this way, just a few steps, you can see there's a pretty dramatic decline in pasture growth. And so now you know it's really easy for me to shuffle my fruit through this pasture. It's it's easily less than than 50% uh, um, the amount of growth. And, um, and so, the, you know, you immediately start to ask yourself, what, what's, uh, what's the problem? What's the difference between that pasture over here and this pasture over here? And so you can actually see one of the clues here. This is a, uh, you know, a common weed that nobody likes called, uh, called thistle. And, um, and there's, you know, there's quite a lot of them throughout here, but you can see there's, there's not a lot of, of ground cover and, um, and not a lot of, of diversity, not a lot of biomass, and lots of thistles. So what, uh, if we come up to this, this soil test pit here, uh, we, can, we can start to see, you know, what some of the, the problems are with this particular soil. So, you know, right off from the bat, you know, there's, there's good organic matter layer, but there's not good ground cover. There's probably about 50% ground cover with plants. If I, if I look down from above. Um, so that automatically puts us at a, at a poor level. Uh, we don't have a very thick organic matter layer. You know, it's, it's maybe, you know, a, a quarter of a centimeter. It's, there's no bare ground per se, but uh, it's, not, it's not ideal. And when, I, when I'm looking for, for soil organisms and I peel back the layers, so there's one ant there, I can see, so that's one, Another ant that still counts as one. Third ant. There are some earthworm castings, but uh, I don't see any other. So we've got only one species of, uh, of macrofauna on the soil surface here. So that kind of gives us a clue as to what's going on here. And if we, uh, if we look into, you know, the pit, you can see we've we've already hit clay at uh, only about eight inches down. We're we're into uh, into yellow clay, and the the soil structure is not as nice. Like there's there's no um, it's still friable because it's nice and wet. But if if this was had been a dry year, this soil would not be as nice even as nice as it is here. But it's still very angular and blocky. There's there's not a lot of crumbs. It's more like a just a wet powder. Um, there's not as good of a, a distribution of, of roots in the soil. And if I start to, to break this guy up, actually one of the, a really good test you can do, it's hard to do one handed here, but is, is to pick your block up and drop it on the soil and see how well it holds together. Um, now this is a pasture, so it's, it's, uh, you know, easily going to be more together than, uh, than some of the, the annual cropland that if you had done tillage recently. So we've got, we've got a good uh, amount of, of root structure. There's a couple earthworms, so that's, that's a good sign. Uh, obviously not as many, oh, maybe we do. There's one, two, three, um, you know, four. So we've, we've, we've got earthworms. That's a, that's a decent size, but the, the soil isn't, doesn't have that, that crumb, uh, big crumb structure like we had in our in our gardens, and um, uh, and you know you can see the the O horizon there is not very 
not very thick. There's not a lot of organic matter on the surface of the soil. Um, and But the, the real kind of telling sign comes when we start to do some, uh, some soil penetrometer readings. So if I take my, my penetrometer and uh, start going down, I start to, uh, to max out my penetrometer and we get into the, you know, plus 300 range pretty quickly at about, about eight inches. And, uh, you know, I've taken a couple readings here and, um, you know, it's, it's not as nice as the other uh, soil in my gardens there. It's, it's still not terrible. And, and we've actually been doing a lot of, of work in this pasture, believe it or not, this is, um, we've actually dramatically improved the, this from what it was even a couple years ago, but we still have some compaction issues. And so, you know, based on, uh, so based on the things that I've seen here, I think the, the major limiting factor is, is oxygen. Um, and, and actually the reason for that, and I, the reason why I know that this field, why there's such a, actually a clean line in between these two uh, paddocks here, is a few years ago, uh, we overgrazed this little corner piece of a field here uh, pretty badly. We had, a, we had some heavy rainfalls, and uh, for whatever reason, we couldn't move the cows off, and, and we actually just, we, we fed them some, some extra hay here just to keep them here for, for an extra day. I think we were, in, we were in the middle of haying season, and we thought, ah, it won't be a big deal. And we got a you know an inch of rain, and the cows really heavily compacted this um, this area of ground, and and since that time, we've had issues in production with this this field. That was you know three four years ago. So that you know the thistles they are a tap rooted plant, and uh, and they thrive in in low oxygen soils where uh, certain minerals like iron and copper are bound up in the soil because, they're, because there's not enough oxygen to make them available. And so that's one of the clues that, that lets me know that we've got some compaction issues in the soil. The penetrometer confirms that. The fact that we've got the earthworms, there's a, there's a, a reasonable amount of organic matter. And particularly in a year like this, where we've, we've had really, really good rainfall, and yet, it, and the rain is clearly making it down into all areas of the soil, but we're not growing grass. So um, that, all those things tell me, based on all the tests that we just did, without even going into the, you know, the water infiltration and, and some of the other fancy ones, that the, the thing I need to focus on in this area is, is oxygen. And so we're actually, you know, introducing in, you know, some tap-rooted plants, things like, this is a, a really nice legume called sandfoin. We've been broadcasting that into this area. Um, we've actually, funnily enough, we've been using cattle impact um, and um, and uh, and earthworms to try to help alleviate some of those compactions. So by by actually bale grazing this area and, and using just a little bit less, uh, not letting the cows compact the ground too much, but but getting them in here to get some hoof action to break up the the top layer of the soil and and bringing in bales here during the winter time to to feed them on this area uh, so that we can have more food in the soil so that it can attract more earthworms so the earthworms can help break up the soil that's been kind of our strategy in this little piece and um actually i'll, I'll take you guys up a bit, a bit further in this pasture where you can see we um we've been kind of using some bales behind me there uh, we did like the first corner of this piece this uh, earlier this year we've been applying compost and um and uh, doing bale grazing out in this piece, but we haven't done it on, on, that, on that side of the field yet. And you can already see the increase in production in this, uh, in this pasture with, uh, with just a few of those, those little strategies there. So, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that that's working um, and, uh, and you, can, you can see how all those four ingredients, like the shelter, the food, the water and the air, they're all, interconnected and and by by using you know different soil health pr principles and that you know optimize disturbance keep the soil covered keep a living root in the ground as long as possible integrated diversity of flora integrated diversity of fauna you can pick and choose which one of those principles you can focus on to help address your soil health weak link
Okay, so we're out in a Climax ecosystem in, right on our farm here. This is a, uh, a ravine on our property that uh, has never been cleared in, in known history. So we've got uh, basically, if we've got a situation where if, you're, if you were to walk away from the land and do nothing for you know, 100 plus years, what would the land turn into? Well, this is what the land would turn into. So there's, there's a whole bunch of insights that we've, I've actually gained from just spending a bit of time in this uh, zone five area on our farm that's just right next to our house here. But we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the insights that can be gained through some of the, the observations of, of soil health. So we've um, right away looking at, you know, the, the ground cover, we can see that we've got almost 100% ground cover. Even, uh, even with the fact that we've got all these trees above us here, uh, the, there's still, uh, you know, all these different layers, we've got, you know, our, our canopy trees, we've got, you know, shrub layers of Saskatoon and roses and red osier dogwood and, um, and then we've got uh, other things like low bush cranberry, we've got uh, hazelnuts, we've got raspberries, we've got uh, uh, Siberian ginseng and uh, um, wintergreen and, and all these other plants that are, that are lower down, they're all helping to, to slow down the 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 sun and and keep this ground from from getting too too hot um, when it comes to the the organic matter layer you know we've obviously got a, a huge amount of of o horizon on the soil here we've got uh, you know easily uh, easily half half an inch or more of that o horizon so that's a really good good sign. But it's interesting when we actually start to dig into the soil, you know, we've, we've got really good, you know, chocolate cake like structure and we've, we've actually got some mycelium there. So that's, that's uh, something that we didn't have in our, in our garden. And we've got a huge um, diversity of root structures. We've got, you know, tree roots and, you know, all different sizes, shapes, depths. Uh, that's a really good sign. But it's, uh, it's interesting that, uh, um, you know the, the we've got the fact that we've got good good crumb structure and everything else, but right beneath the soil there is um, we're actually already at clay. You know this is uh, this is not very good topsoil. Just six inches down, after even even a hundred years after yet yeah, after a hundred years of of uh, work through ecosystem processes, we've still got you know poor soil just a few inches beneath the, the good soil that we've got on the, um, on the surface here. And so, you know, it's, it's actually interesting that, you know, we, in, our, in the garden that we, we did the first test on, you know, that soil was, was uh, basically clay right through and through with a little bit of topsoil on top. And in less than 10 years, we've completely gotten rid of that clay. When I, when I dug down twice as deep as I did this hole, we st still hadn't yet found, found clay. And so one of the really exciting things about soil health and, and, and those soil health principles is that we can rapidly improve the, um, the health of our soils faster than any uh, ecosystem that didn't have humans in it. And um, so, you know, there's, there's obviously no, uh, no compaction. You know, there's no compaction in this, in this soil, uh, although there are lots of roots that I'm hitting. But it's, it's funny, as, as soon as I get down, uh, when it comes to soil, when, when it comes to, to, when it comes to doing my penetrometer readings, the, um, the soil health is good until I get down into those lower regions and then I start to max out my, uh, my penetrometer reading. So if I come down to the clay here, past where I've already dug, you know, we're, we're already getting into, um, into some stiff, stiff conditions there. And uh, you know that's that's not a not a good sign. So it's it's really interesting to think about you know the what the weak link in this particular ecosystem is is uh, it's probably um, food. I, I would have to say you know there's obviously not moisture. The the air isn't a problem. And um, uh, but food in in the in the sense that. There, there actually needs to be a little bit more disturbance in this ecosystem um, to help allow those um, that carbon to go a little bit deeper. Uh, what's what tends to happen in in 
climax successional ecosystems like this is that all the biomass, all the carbon ends up being up in the, the canopies and not enough of it is, is able to go into the soils. And uh, this is particularly bad in, in tropical rainforests um, where the, the nutrient cycle is actually so fast. So the, there's actually um, a shortage of food in that it, it can't actually get into the, to the soil to be stored long term. And, and that's, that's not particularly um, bad from uh, the standpoint of a forest. It works for that. But for, for humans in, in, and, and also for the ability to sequester the most amount of carbon possible, uh, perhaps cycling between forests and grasslands and maybe even some annual uh, agricultural systems, we might be able to get our top cells to go much, much deeper as well as increasing the overall carbon content, uh, thus the food. So I hope you guys enjoyed that video about that visual soil health assessment and you know 10 simple tests that you can do with nothing more than a shovel and your naked eye and then those five you know additional tests that you can do with you know uh, basically an extra you know 100 200 dollars worth of, of of tools and uh the the nice thing about these these tests and, and the, the the reason why i broke them up into you know the, the kind of those 15 metrics is is that they they all come at uh, there's there's a bunch of different uh ways of, of trying to triangulate what the, the weak link is in your soil health, whether it's the oxygen, the water, the food, or the shelter. And, and, and all of those measure different things in the soil. And, and if, by, by having those 10 tests at a minimum, that can typically tell you which, which of those, those factors is, is going to be your weak link. And, and those, those five extra tests um, will, will for sure rein it in if, uh, if there's any extra problems that you might have. But um, when you get really good at this soil test, you can literally just go around and, you know, pull up a handful of, of soil, you know, on the, the roots of, uh, of, you know, a plant or something like that. And, and basically do a, a soil test just by looking at this. I mean, it's like, you know, I know that there's, there's, no, there's no issues with, um, with this other garden that we have, have here where you, we're using the same kind of cover cropping techniques. To, uh, to help address those very soil health weak links. So make sure that you go out and, and you know, do a few of these tests on your property, actually working through all, all 10 of those, those soil health metrics at a minimum. And uh, uh, if you have some of the other tools are available, do the other 15, but try to find the, the best place on your, on your property where you think your soil health is gonna be the healthiest, uh, and then find the worst place in your soil, test that, but also make sure you, you go uh, somewhere within your biome and test the soil. It doesn't necessarily have to be on your property. Ideally, you'd have uh, a Climax ecosystem that would be in a zone five that you can go and observe. But you want to use that as a baseline for how healthy your soil could be given you know, the, all the different climatic, geographic, uh, you know, water uh, constraints that, that exist within, within your area. And by, by doing that, if you spent, you know, an hour or two hours testing three places, the best place, the worst place, and a climax ecosystem on your property, you will probably learn more about soil health just by kind of triangulating those three things, thinking about the weak link, what the weak link is on your property, than you will from watching hours and hours of YouTube videos. Uh, I really wish that I had, um, you know, come across information like this, uh, you know, years earlier. I've spent literally thousands and thousands of dollars on between soil health tests from three or four different labs. Uh, I've, I've actually purchased a soil microscope. Uh, that was like $2,000 because I thought that was what I needed to, to fix my soil health. Uh, I've spent uh, two or $3,000 on soil amendments, things like bentonite clay and compost tea and rock phosphate, only to have them you know, not really work or, or not address the, uh, the, the fundamental weak link in the problem. It was just treating symptoms. Uh, and with, yet with these, with a simple test that you can do with just a shovel, you can, uh, you can diagnose your, your own weak link in your soil and develop your own management plan to start addressing those soil health weak links that fits within the rest of the design of your property. Um, and that's perfectly tailored to your land. So, um, again, I hope you enjoyed this particular diagnosis exercise and, uh, I look forward to hearing what some of your insights were. We'll talk to you later.